April for the many ways that we've been able to worship you thus far this morning and singing and giving and reading your word and fellowshipping together and praying and God we ask now that as we turn to your word that you would give us humble hearts give us ears to hear and eyes to see Lord remind us this morning that you are God and we are your people that you are the one who has spoken and we are to submit to your word you're the one who's in control and not us and let us be abundantly grateful for that Lord and so I ask Lord that you would help me to preach clearly and boldly and be out of the way of the text this morning and that God you would do what only your spirit can do take any words that are said from our ears to our hearts and cause us to live differently it's in your name we pray amen uh, good morning, everyone. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 11. Jeremiah chapter 11. Jeremiah 11. Uh, this morning uh, marks our final sermon in our uh, series through the Old Testament. And uh, uh, it has been, for me at least, a tremendous time to just be immersed in God's Word and the Old Testament even specifically, and just to, be, to see over and over the glorious truths, truths of the glories of God throughout his, uh, throughout his redemptive plan and how that began not with Israel, not with Jacob, not with Isaac, not with Abraham, not with Noah, uh, but began not even with Adam and Eve, but from, from before time itself began, as the New Testament even reminds us. And to see how it's all threaded together and to see how God had a glorious plan to, re, to uh, not only receive glory to himself, but then reveal to his creation this great way that they can bring him glory and worship him. Now, we've been talking a lot about God being a faithful God throughout, throughout uh, this study, and rightly so. We, we've been seeing his faithfulness over and over in light of his promises that he's made. And as you know, when we talk about God's promises, we're talking about his covenants with his people. We think about his covenant with <clears throat> Noah, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. All covenants that reflect his heart to reconcile a people back to himself ultimately with the purpose of restoring his creation to a place where he could dwell among them once again. Different than the way that he even dwelled among them as they traveled out of Egypt through the wilderness. You may remember where he had them build a tabernacle so that he would be able to dwell among his people. But along with that came laws. Because for him, a holy God to dwell among his people, they had to be striving to live holy themselves. This time, what God has been aiming at really all along, but what we're going to look at this morning, is the, the complete restoration of all things. Not God merely dwelling in a tabernacle or in a tent, but really the, the, main, the, the, the thing that he had been, has been aiming at all along, even from the Garden of Eden, that he would dwell among his people. And yet, there, there's a corner that's turned as Israel is facing exile where we've been at now at, at the course of Israel's history. As they're facing exile, and, and as they have, uh, we've already studied them being exiled out of their land, but even at the prophets that we're going to be looking at, them facing exile and even living outside of the promised land that they were given. We come across a new promise made by God to his people. A promise that rightly is understood to, to supersede the previous covenants, and yet one that keeps the threads of past covenants alive. We're talking about the new covenant. Sadly, something as amazing as the promises that we're going to read and that we're going to study today, they, they often get lost in, in various theological debates. 
And as those debates are happening, as these realities are being discussed, oftentimes there's a couple of issues that happen. One, we get away from Scripture, and we get away from, from the text itself, where God has communicated these things to us, and instead we like to, to, to hypothesize and let, uh, and let our thoughts just kind of take us to how we believe these will flush out. And we get away from the text itself. But another thing that happens is we, we can miss the picture of a God who stays true to his word. You see, when, when we're talking about covenants, we're talking about something that God has actually promised. We're not talking about some, some vague idea. We're not talking about some hypothetical situation. We're talking about actual promises that God has promised. And, and we don't want to miss the picture of a God who stays truth to, truth to those promises and to his word. And so this morning, we're going to allow Scripture to inform our understanding of the New Covenant and why it is so amazing, why it is so set apart, why it is so important. We're going to do this by just slowly making our way through the, the primary Old Testament texts that, that speak of the New Covenant. And we're going to start with Jeremiah chapter 31. So turn there if you're not there yet. Jeremiah chapter 31, starting at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this the for this the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. I want you to just notice a few things about what it is that we read. First is that when we're thinking about the history of Israel at this point, uh, we don't want to gloss over the fact that, that Jeremiah here writes the words of the Lord that says, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is a new covenant that is no longer acknowledging that this break of the, of, the, of the kingdom of Israel into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. But this, uh, comes, this covenant shows that the return to the single household of God. This covenant would be different than previous covenants. See, past covenants that God made with Israel... The, the, the making, maybe not the making, but the, the retaining, that's a better word, the retaining of these covenants was in a lot of ways in the, the, the hearts and the hands of the, the, the people themselves. And we saw time and time again that Israel broke these previous covenants. As their sin, time and time again, uh, uh, took hold of who it is that they would worship and how it is that they would worship. Instead of them staying true to the covenant-keeping God, instead of them staying true in their worship to the God that made that these covenants, they broke them to over and over and over. Notice also that God does mention the word law here. But it's a different kind of law. This is not God saying, uh, before it was written on stone tablets, but this time I'm going to give it to you in some way that is, uh, in some other tangible way that, that no one will ever be able to get rid of, that, that, that no one will be able to slam down and break, that no one will have to refer back to in some way. But instead, this law, he says, is going to be written on their hearts. This is a law that would be internal. This is a law that would clearly show that they were a people, not just externally, but a people from their heart within. And it says, they shall know, they shall all know 
God. If you've ever done a study on that word no in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, you'll know that, that oftentimes that word is not talking about just mere head knowledge. It's not just talking about uh, they know their God in the sense of like, like the great Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4, that they're going to repeat a bunch of things and memorize those things and then in turn know God. No, what, uh, oftentimes it's talking about even an intimate relationship. And here, what... Jeremiah is talking about, what God is explaining through Jeremiah is, is that the, his people, those that, that had broken previous covenants, those who now would have the law written on their hearts, they would have an intimate relationship with God that, that really wouldn't be dependent merely on head knowledge, but on a work that God would do. And you may ask, well, what is that work that God would do? Well, for starters, it's a work that cleanses them. It's a work that cleanses them. As he says there in verse 34, For I will forgive their iniquity and remember, remember their sin no more. So now you have a people that he's not saying uh, they have to do these sacrificial works in order for their sins to be atoned for, in order for their sins to be forgiven. Instead, you have God saying, I'm going to forgive their iniquity. Their sin will be forgotten. This is actually, uh, these verses here are quoted and, and explained a little bit more in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. And yet the, the, the primary and the laser focus uh, in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, and really all the context around it, is, is dead set on Jesus' blood being shed as the formal high priest and final sacrifice to enact his covenant. Go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 13. When you look at, at when, when you think about even the book of Hebrews and, and how it, it slowly comes to a close, Hebrews chapter 13, starting at verse 20. We're not going to spend much time in Hebrews this morning, but I would recommend if you're wanting to, uh, to really dive into the New Covenant even more, Hebrews is a phenomenal book to spend some time reading through this week. Hebrews chapter 13, starting at 20, says, Now may the God of peace, who brought, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The covenant that he's talking about there, the one that Jesus shed his blood to ratify, is the very covenant that, we, that Jeremiah is talking about in Jeremiah 31 in those verses there. But Jeremiah is not the only one who talks about this covenant. Jeremiah is not the only prophet. This isn't, uh, this isn't some uh, theological structure that we're creating out of a mere four or a few verses in the Old Testament. It's actually riddled throughout in different ways and alluded to, but there's another prophet who speaks very explicitly and clearly about this covenant. That's the prophet Ezekiel. Go ahead and turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. Starting at verse 25, Ezekiel 34, starting at 25. He says, I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers of their season. They shall be showers of blessing. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I break the bars of their yoke, and deliver them from the hand of those who enslave them. They shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely 
and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them renowned plantations, so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land, and no longer suffer the reproach of the nations. Verse 30, And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord. It's interesting, even at the end of that, you hear that sheep and shepherd language that was even mentioned in Hebrews 13 regarding, in regards to Christ. But, but in verse 25 here, we, we start off seeing, and the way that this prophet uh, begins talking about this new covenant is that it would be a covenant of peace. And, and we may hear that today and think, well, why is that such a big deal? We may hear that and think, that, think in that way and just glance over that because we generally as a people live in peace. We're not, we're not living in a time of war in our country. We're not living in a time that, that we're being persecuted as Christians. Not, not as much as other countries. I mean, think about this. We, we have doors open right now uh, in the back of this building. We've been able to sing of Christ. We're, we've been able to, we're able to preach the good news of, of, of the gospel and the good news and preach from scripture. And the, we're safe right now. I, I bring that up to say that it's easy to, to glance over how big of a deal this was that, they would, that, that, it, they, that God would make with them a covenant of peace. Remembering that Israel as a people time and time again were, were under attack and Israel as a people time and time again were being uh, um, uh, attacked by and vandalized by other nations around them. Many, many times of which was a part of God's sovereign plan and judgment against them for their sin. But he says, no, I'm going to make a covenant of peace. This peace would be from wild beasts and from nations. This covenant would also include blessing. If trees and earth would bear increase of produce, there would be security. The people would no longer be preyed upon by other nations. There would be no more hunger, no more famine, no reproach among the nations. And even in verse 30, just as Jeremiah had noted in Jeremiah 31, there would be an assurance of their relationship with their God. They would no longer wonder. There would be no longer any season that they would wonder, are we the people of God? They would no longer be able to look out at their sin and wonder, have we broken this relationship? Have we broken this covenant with God? But no, instead, they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them. And that they, the house of Israel, and my people, declares the Lord God. And again, that God and sheep dynamic that's mentioned there in verse 31. But that's not the only place that Ezekiel talks about this covenant. Turn to chapter 34 of Ezekiel. Starting at verse 22. Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 22. Sorry if I said 34. 36, starting at verse 22. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, and note, note these words, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord. When through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, 
and you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were no good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, verse 33, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt, and the land that was desolate shall be tilled instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am the Lord. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I am the Lord. I have spoken and will do it. Verse 37, thus says the Lord God, this also I will let, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, to increase their people like a flock like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feasts, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know that I am the Lord. You can't get through that. You see the bookends, right? You can't get through that without realizing that, that God's primary concern is his own glory. That God's primary concern, first and foremost, is that his name would be vindicated. And all of this is for the sake of his holy name. And the people would be gathered back into their land from among the nations. And they'd be clean from unholiness and idols. And they'd be given a new heart and new spirit within them. And this heart of stone would be replaced with a heart of flesh. When you hear language like that, and we're, we're going to get to this, but when you hear language like that, you can't help but to think about the realities that, that, ha that happened when, when Jesus came and the words of even being born again and being born and made, made new in light of Christ, being born of God, even as First John puts it. And his spirit will be within his people, causing obedience, causing intentional devotion, Again, you see how God's plan is, we're getting the full picture of God's plan for this new covenant. Because you can ask the question, how would they live in obedience? How would they have the law within them? How would they no longer need to sacrifice? Well, it's because His Spirit would be within His people. And we can't miss what verse 28 says. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. They would dwell in the land that had been promised. Deliverance, in verse 29, from uncleanness, abundance of grain and no famine. There, there would even be a hatred of past sin. There'd be a call to repentance. And they'd be cleansed from their iniquities. And, and you see explicitly mentioned there in verse 35 that, that, they would, that the land would be like Eden. Pointing, very, uh, pointing back to the very initial plan of God. And all nations would acknowledge the Lord. And once again, the God and sheep dynamic and increase of people. Go ahead and fast forward to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37, starting at verse 20. When the sticks on which you write are in your hand before their eyes, then say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, and will gather them from all around, and bring them to their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king 
shall be king over them all. And they shall be no longer two nations and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols and their detestable things or with any other transgressions. But I will save them from all the backslidings in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. My servant David shall be king over them. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. These verses especially when we read those verses, when we read those aspects and those details about this new covenant, uh, hopefully there are different light bulbs going off in your head where you see all the clear threads, not just, uh, not just from this covenant, but from this covenant back through all the other promises that God has made. That he's able to allude to and talk about David being king over them. That he's able to talk about this being an everlasting covenant. That he's able to, to, to mention, and, and hear me clearly, that he is able to mention uh, literal land, referring to literal promises that all of them who would have heard this at that time would have understood. That he would be able to mention them being multiplied. And the nations themselves knowing that he is the Lord. These are all things that, that, that are threaded to and are, are clearly tied to past covenants that God has made. And, and, and let me just encourage you, when you read those things, don't, don't start to just go down different tributaries and, and think about uh, down different trails. First and foremost, recognize this as a God who has made promises and is faithful to those promises and will remain faithful to those promises until they are fulfilled the way that he promised them. They'll be gathered in the land as one people, one king, one nation. No more defilement. They'll be cleansed. David will be king over them, prince forever. A covenant of peace, an everlasting covenant, children and children's children. And they will have a dwelling and, and God will dwell there among his people. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 29, says this, And I will not hide my face any more from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Even in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 13, verse 13 there is a clear division of the land. There are the measurements of the altar by cubits, I'm sorry, I'm reading from the wrong chapter. 47 verse 13, Thus says the Lord God, This is the boundary by which you shall divide the land for inheritance among the twelve tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions, and you shall divide equally what I swore to give your fathers. This land shall fall to you as an inheritance. Uh, let, me, let me just remind you, these are prophets talking of things that have yet to happen. These are prophets not referring back to things that have happened, but in anticipation of God fulfilling these promises, even to the point of division of land. Like I already mentioned, the, the continuity between the, the new covenants and old covenants is, is all throughout it. You can't get away from it. And really, the, the need to feel like we have to reinterpret the Old Testament, the need to feel like we have to look at these promises and say, well, I know it says land there, but that can't really be what it means. I know it says eternal, but that can't really be what it means. I know it says that, 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 uh, that 
that there will be a king who will reign over this people in the line of David, but that can't really be what it means. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary, and oftentimes what we fall into are traps of looking at the Old Testament and saying, you know what, without the New Testament, we cannot understand what the Old Testament means, and that is not true. Jesus himself taught from the Old Testament. There's clarity that we gain from the New Testament. In the New Testament, we see clearly Jesus being the Messiah. In the New Testament, we, see, we get clarity on how it is God decided to, to flesh these things out. But that is so different than deciding or feeling the need to reinterpret the Old Testament from the New Testament. That's not what we need to do. And so when we look at these promises and when we're reading through the Old Testament, many of them, and we allow hermeneutics to guide us in this, we're talking about literal aspects to these promises. So yes, we can trace Jesus as a clear fulfillment of the Davidic king to reign on the earth, as the one who would bring together all nations, as the, the full and final forgiveness of God's people. And Jesus and the apostles make all of that clear. And yet there was also an understanding that there were aspects of this that were yet to come. There were aspects of how Jesus would reign. There were aspects of how he would be this king who would reign uh, that were still yet to come. You think about Acts chapter 1 itself. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, uh, Jesus had spent uh, all of this time teaching the apostles uh, about the kingdom of God, teaching, teaching about how it is that he would even reign over them in the kingdom of God. And yet in verse 6 of Acts chapter 1, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they, they knew, we'll pause there for a second. They knew that it would be clear when the kingdom was restored to Israel. They knew that when the Old Testament, that when the prophets talked about a Davidic king, that that meant that they would see a reigning king over Israel. And so they asked, is it now? Is it going to happen at this time? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then he goes up into the clouds. See, they understood there were things that were yet to come. When we think about what Jesus said of the New Covenant, Jesus himself associated the Lord's Supper with the New Covenant. His shed blood is truly what ratified the New Covenant. When, like I mentioned when we began, uh, we don't want to get kind of lost in the weeds in some of the theological debate on this, although it's important to, to study those things. But, but, but I just want to leave this, this very simple statement with you, that there is no New Covenant without Jesus. There is no New Covenant for being fulfilled without Jesus without his perfect life, without the fact that he was able to be the perfect one, never sinning with zero iniquities whatsoever, and without his death as an atonement for the sins of all who would believe in him, as that final sacrifice. You see, when, when God says, even in, in, in the, those Old Testament prophets, when he says that he would forgive the iniquities of Israel, it's not that he all of a sudden is no longer just, it's not that he all, all of a sudden no longer would look at sin. No, that, that, that sin still had to be punished. And the only way that God has provided, and the ultimate way, and the eternal way that God has provided uh, an atonement or a payment, for, a payment for our sins is through Jesus' death on the cross. So that our record of sin along with its legal demands would be forgiven. There's no new covenant without Jesus' perfect life or his death. There's no new covenant without his resurrection. You see, there would be a problem, wouldn't there? If Jesus had come and lived a perfect life, died, and then stayed dead. Why would that have been a problem? 
Well, this covenant is supposed to be an eternal covenant. This covenant is supposed to be one that would last into all eternity. And just like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then, then we would be just much to be pitied. We would have no future resurrection to long for and look to. So there's no new covenant without Jesus' resurrection, and there's no new covenant without his return to judge and reign. I, I am thoroughly convinced that, that unless we understand the realities of Jesus' return and of his judgment on the earth and his reign here on earth, we, we are not talking about the new covenant. We are not talking about the covenant that those who would have heard those for the first time and the prophets who would have uttered those words uh, would have understood. The new covenant has clear promises that God will be faithful to. That's why as new covenant believers, that's why as those whose faith is in Christ and the work that he did on the cross and his resurrection, that's why we're even commanded to, to regularly remember his death until he returns. The very way that we, are, the very way that we uh, um, remember this new covenant and our place in this new covenant is pointing to his death, his death on the cross. I've talked a lot about the, the new covenant and Israel itself, but let me remind you of what Romans talks, of what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 10. I'm sorry, not 10, chapter 11. As you may know, the, the, the promises of the covenant were not relegated only to national Israel, only to ethnic Jews, but also extended to Gentiles who would place their faith in Christ. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 11, starting at verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, is talking of the Jews. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. So now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? I am speaking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am in an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from death? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches." And listen to his argument here. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off, so that I might be grafted in. That is true, they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. The whole point of Paul's argument there is simply that you have the, the original uh, olive tree itself being Israel. And even though God clearly uh, is cutting off branches, even though God is clearly only leaving a remnant of that, he would still remain faithful to them. And a part of, and a part of his plan of pruning that tree would be that Gentiles would be grafted into that tree, grant, gra grafted, excuse me, into the people of God. And so you have salvation brought not only to Israel, not only to the Jews, but also to the world, to the Gentiles. That is extremely relevant to us today. That's extremely applicable to us today. As we, as the church, point to and look to Christ's sacrifice so that we could be grafted into the people of God. 
And truly, that's what we remember when we partake even of the Lord's Supper, the very work that brought us into the people of God. As the word says, once we were not a people, but now we are a people. So that's the new covenant. Uh, that, that hopefully, if you're hearing all of that clearly, uh, that the new covenant is the very uh, is the very covenant that you and I have been promised, that you and I have been grafted into. The new covenant is the very covenant that that Jesus came to fulfill and to, to ratify and to initiate through his ministry, his life, his death, and resurrection. And it's the new covenant that we even think about and celebrate whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper. This morning, uh, I know it's not the first Sunday of the month, but uh, the, the timing, the, the Lord's timing is perfect. The timing of it worked out that uh, as I'm gone for July, we, we shifted the Lord's Supper to this morning, uh, and so we will not be partaking it next week, but, but instead we'll do it this morning. And, and I love the Lord's timing and his plan, that we can focus on the new covenant wrapping up our time through the Old Testament, wrapping up our study of God's glorious plan through the Old Testament with this new covenant promise and sign that God has given us. I want you to go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 26. Oftentimes when we're partaking in the Lord's Supper, I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, and you guys are are primarily listening, but, but I want you to get your eyes on The words in Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 26. It actually, as uh, as, as we read this, uh, the music team, you can start to come up, and and the men who are going to be doing the Lord's Supper, you can start to get that ready as well. Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 26. It says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the apostles, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. For the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus made the connection abundantly clear that the work at that point that he was about to do and his blood being shed on the cross was the very sign of the covenant, was the very means through which God would fulfill uh, these, these details and aspects of the covenant through him. So I'm going to take a moment and pray here, uh, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and go through partaking of this very sign of the new covenant. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for uh, your love toward us. Uh, we're grateful. That you, have, that you have remained faithful to your promises, God. We're grateful that we can rest in the forgiveness of our sins and iniquities and our sins being forgiven and forgotten by you, Lord. We know that this did not come free, but came at the highest cost possible, the death of your son on a cross and his blood being shed and his body being broken. And yet we're grateful that you have not left any of the work to be done for us to be saved. That there is no work that we do, there's no aspect of obedience to any law that would, that would gain us favor before you as the work has been completed on the cross. And so we ask, Lord, that we would be those whose faith is in Christ and in that work, that we'll be those who live humbly before you and we would be those who would strive to live holy because you are holy because you have called us unto yourself. Even as we remember the Lord's death, our Lord's death on the cross, let us not cut the the ties that are clearly there to the promises that you have made to your people and even to the nation of Israel, Lord, that have been yet to be fulfilled. 
And we look forward to the day that, that your people will see the, the, the complete fulfillment of these promises. We thank you, Lord, for, for being a gracious God, for being a faithful God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.